I want you guys to go on ahead and grab your seat. Pastor Joe said everything about me that you would need to know. I'm going to just jump straight in. Is that okay? I, I, I'm on assignment tonight. Um, I'm on assignment. In fact, I, I was wrestling with God um, because I wanted to. Oh, no. Can you keep playing, please? Thank you. I sound more spiritual when you play. I, I, I was wrestling on, on what, to, what to preach on. And this is actually a message that the Holy Spirit has just been, been telling me to share. And as I was praying on what to speak tonight, I, I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't get away from it. And, and, and here's, here's where we're at. Here's where we're at. The enemy is speaking. But that's not a shock because he's always speaking. And we know that his native tongue is deceit, which means he's always lying. It's not a surprise that he's speaking. The issue is, is that many of you are listening. The word that the Holy Spirit wants to release over you tonight is one of hope, one that would release you of fear. Because where you're currently at where you're currently at is you're in a season where you're doing things that seem normal, but they're not normal because you're not able to enjoy it like you used to enjoy it. Some of you have lost your laughter. You've lost your joy. You used to dance in the presence of God. You're no longer dancing in the presence of God. You're, you're confuddled. You're, you're confused. You're, you're frustrated felt the Holy Spirit say, tell them that they're about to get their joy back. Tell them that they're going to start dancing again. They're going to start, they're going to start singing again. They're, they're going to start dreaming again. There are some of you here that are suffering with night terrors. And, and just so that we're on the same page here, who, real quick, I don't mean to embarrass you, but if you suffer with night terrors, just lift up your hand. Just throw it up and then put it back down. Yep, yep, yep. You, you've been dealing with night terrors. The Holy Spirit's saying you're about to get your rest back. And not only are you about to get your rest back, but you're going to start resting so that you could start dreaming. And as you start dreaming, you're going to get glimpses glimpses of your future. You haven't been able to do that because you've been bound by fear. He says, but put a pen and pad next to your, next to your bed because I'm going to speak to you and you're going to wake up and you're going to want to write down what you dreamt because you're not going to just dream good dreams. You're going to get pictures of the future. You're going to wake up with game plans. You're going to wake up with business models. You're going to wake up with words and they're going to be imperative for the season that you're about to enter into. It says you're about to step out, step in. And as you step into what's coming, the fear that's been bothering you is about to break off. I want to draw your attention tonight to three verses in John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. Now these three verses are not really that, that famous. They kind, of, they kind of get just read over quickly because the verses that lead up to these verses are really famous. Verses 1 through 8 are some of the most famous verses in the Bible. In, in this moment of the text, here's what's happening. In verses 1 through 8, here's what's happening. Jesus is at a dinner party. He's at a dinner party at his friend's house. His friend's names are Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We know that the nature of this dinner party is celebratory. It's celebratory because only a few days prior, Lazarus was sick. And not only was he sick, he was dead. Jesus shows up on the scene and resurrects him. Now they're celebrating. And as they're celebrating, this is the famous moment where Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is sitting at the feet of Jesus and she breaks out expensive perfume. She, she takes expensive oil and she starts to pour it on the feet of Jesus. And then she lets down her hair and then she starts to use her hair to massage the oil into the feet of Jesus. Can you imagine how sweet that moment must have been? Simultaneously, simultaneously. 
There's a man there named Judas. Judas is one of the 12 disciples. In fact, all 12 of Jesus' disciples are present. But this is the moment where Judas decides to speak up because inwardly he's already betrayed Jesus, but he hasn't gone public with his decision yet. So he says in this moment, he says in this moment, Jesus, tell Mary to put the perfume away because she's wasting it. We could actually take the money that we could make from the perfume and we could use it on the poor. When in actuality, we know that he could care less about the poor. He just didn't want to see Mary pouring her oil on Jesus. So he's frustrated and he's annoyed. But then Jesus says very famously, let her be. Which, my goodness, that would preach all day. Let her be. Let her worship. You don't know why she's worshiping me the way she's worshiping me right now. You don't don't know how expensive that perfume is. You think it's this, but it's actually something else. It's It's actually really richer than you could ever imagine. This is what's happening inside of the house. The three verses that I want to read to you is what's happening outside of the house simultaneously this isn't a later moment this is all the same moment says this in John 12 verses 9 through 11 it says when all the people heard of Jesus's arrival they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus the man Jesus had raised from the dead And then this is the part that got me. It's right here. Verse 10. Look at this. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. When I read that, it got me because I've read this dozens and dozens of times before, but it never stuck out to me like it did recently. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Imagine, imagine what's happening. Let me just set up, the, set up the, the picture real quick of what's happening. There are dozens and dozens, hundreds and hundreds of people outside of the house, knowing that they're not going to get inside of the house to where Jesus is, but they would settle on standing outside of the house because they just wanted a glimpse. They wanted a glimpse of Jesus, and they wanted a glimpse of Lazarus. They wanted a glimpse of Jesus, and they wanted a glimpse of Lazarus. And they're, they're there almost like groupies you've ever been somewhere where there's a whole bunch of groupies they're just surrounding and just a building I I live in New York and we see these things all the time the true story a few weeks ago I was driving through the East Village after getting a haircut and as I'm driving through the East Village all of a sudden I have to come to a stop because I'm surrounded I'm surrounded by by dozens and dozens of teenage and young adult females I rolled down the window and I said what's going on Someone screamed out, Taylor Swift is inside. So I couldn't move because T-Swizzle was over there. (laughs) This is what's happening in the text. People have showed up just to get a glimpse of Jesus and Lazarus. Now, majority of the people are there to celebrate because my goodness, what an incredible, what an incredible thing that has happened. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But then you read verse 10, the Bible says that the leading priest showed up and he decided to now kill Lazarus too, which tells me that not everyone that shows up to a celebration is there to celebrate. Which is why you never misconstrue a crowd for all believing in the same thing. Majority of people are there to celebrate. Others are there because they're speculating. They're, they're wondering, is Lazarus really alive? Or, or are they pulling off a weekend at Bernie's and there's a pole behind Lazarus's head and they just got him moving on the inside? And then there's this really small minority that showed up because they knew it was true, but they hated it. They knew it was real. But they didn't want it to be real, which makes sense, which makes sense. Because anytime God's people show up to praise, the enemy starts to plot. 
It's just how it works. It's just, it's just how it works. Anytime God's people show up to praise on a Wednesday night when your kids just went back to school and say, I'm going to show up and I'm going to worship regardless. I'm going to get into the presence of Jesus. It's good that I'm around my brothers and my sisters. Anytime God's people show up, the enemy starts going, I got to figure something out to keep them from going back to that church or I got to get them discouraged so that they don't worship really hard or so that they don't lift up their hands or so that they don't participate. And now you might might be hearing that going oh my goodness that's overwhelming but but I don't say that to overwhelm you I, I say it to make you aware but the truth is it shouldn't overwhelm you because look at Psalm 21 verse 11 although they plot against you their evil schemes will never succeed so although they plot you keep on praising although they hate you keep on rejoicing tonight the enemy wants you to know, he wants you to believe that what he says is true. But God wants you to understand that it doesn't matter what the enemy says because his plans are great for your life. I want to speak to you from this idea. They are no problem. They just talk like they are. They're not a problem. They're just talking like they're a problem. Can we pray one more time? Holy Spirit, speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Can we just thank God for the worship team and all the musicians? We appreciate you so much. Today's scripture of focus is found in John 12 verses 9 through 11. And in John 12 verses 9 through 11, it's actually it's actually the last time it's actually the last time that we read the name Lazarus in the Bible. Although commentators and theologians would tell us that it seems to be that after Lazarus's resurrection, he actually returned to the kind of life he had before his sickness and death as a mortal human being. Some would also argue, some would also argue that he actually becomes ordained a bishop. So either way, he lived on, which I find both splendid and surprising. I find it splendid and I find it surprising. I find it splendid because, because here he is after dying, being resurrected. Not only does he get to return to his normal life, he actually gets an upgrade within his life. He gets a promotion and he, he now becomes a bishop. I, I find that absolutely splendid. But I also find it surprising because I read what I read in John 12 verse 10 and it made me believe something different. It says that in the the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, which made me believe something else. See, the last time we hear of him, the last time we hear of him, many were being saved because of him. And as a result of that, the enemy decided, I want him dead. And yet, although the enemy decided that he should die, he did not die. Although the enemy decided that he should die, he should die, the, the Although the enemy decided that he should die, he did not die. In other words, the enemy had a plan, yes, but the plan did not pan out. The enemy had a plan, but the plan did not pan out. Lazarus remained untouched by the enemy and ends up more blessed by God. But Pastor Chris, the enemy made a decision. Yes, but so did God. The enemy decided that he should die. God made a decision, he will live. And this is where we have to understand tonight that what God says is way more important than what the enemy says. I hear the Holy Spirit telling me to tell you that you will live. Life will get better. Healing is coming to the body. The marriage will be restored. The finances are coming your way. The business will flourish. I know it doesn't seem like it right now, but he told you to start it. You are obedient, although you're in a bit of a rough patch. 
church. He's saying it's all a part of my plan. You're about to be used for my glory. Although you are in the middle of it, I am telling you it's about to get better. It's, you're about to get an upgrade. You're about to get a promotion. You're about to get your rest back. You're about to get your sleep back. What you thought wasn't coming to you is actually on its way to you because God has decided already about you. And here's what he's saying. You will live. And not only will you live, he has life for you. And it's life of abundance. He says, I have goodness for you. I have wellness for you. I have health for you. I, I have all the supply that you need. I have all of it for you. I have made a decision about you. And guess what? My decision overrides any other decision that anyone else could ever make. The part that I am hoping, the part that I am hoping that you get in your spirit tonight is that any time a decision is outside of the will of God, that decision will fall short of success. So the enemy could decide whatever he wants to decide about you, about your marriage, about your children, about your mental health, about your future, about your business, about your family. He could decide whatever he wants to decide. But that is none of our business because we, we belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But the more he could keep you paying attention to what it is that he's saying, he'll have you to believe that he actually has some type of authority. But the fact of the matter is that's all a part of his plot but although he plots you don't need to worry about it because his plots will not prosper psalm 21 11 says although they plot against you their evil schemes will what never succeed you know what that tells me people of god you are protected if you are a born-again believer, if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you know, you know you belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords, I need all those people to make some noise real quick. I need all the certain people. I belong to Jesus. He is mine and I am his. He is my Lord. He is my God. Come on, all the saved people, just take a quick praise break. Just, just give them a shout. I'm, I'm saved. I, I know who my Lord is. I, I know who my King is. I know who I belong to. I belong to Jesus. Come on, give them a shout of certainty. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. So all of you people, you're protected. We are protected. That is so sobering. We are protected. Although they try to take you out, although they plot against you, it doesn't matter why, because you are protected. As I was studying the text, I learned for the first time that the name Lazarus actually translates to God has helped. I thought to myself, dang, that's a cool name. I wish my name meant that, you know what I mean? God has helped. Only to realize through the writings of Paul in the New Testament that if you're a born-again believer, your name means that and more. In fact, I don't even need to know your name to tell you what your name means. Because if you are born again, you have a whole definition that is beautiful and godly that goes along with your name. You want to know what your, ma your name means? You ready? Here it is. God has helped. God is helping. God will continue to help. Come on, how good is that? God has helped. He's helped me in my past. God is helping. He's helping in my present. God will continue to help. My future is already taken care of. For the one that is worried, well, if he helped me before, will he help me again? He says, son, daughter, I love you. Therefore, I will help you, and I will continue to help you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I am with you. I go with you. I follow you. I will walk with you, even through the valley of the 
the shadow of death. But guess what? We are coming out on the other side of it. Why? Because not only have I helped you, I'm helping you, and I'll continue to help you. I'll help you with the problems you bring to me, and I'll help you with the problems you're not even aware of. I'll help you with the things that you're concerned about, and I'll help you with the plots that are being plotted against you that you're not even mindful of. I am God. I am for you, and I am with you. Therefore, you will never be without help. If anyone else is grateful for that, put a shout on it. We are protected. This is why I love Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4. It says, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. He, he fights for you to save you. He, he goes with you. He, he takes care of all of it. And yet, as beautiful and powerful as this verse is, I find that so many believers know how to recite it, but they find it difficult to believe it. Well, they believe it's true for everyone else but them. And if we're being honest, if we're being honest, it takes one to know one. I've been there. I've had moments where I was questioning if God was actually going to help me out, if he was actually going to help solve this issue that I was facing. I've, I've been in moments. I've, I've been in moments just like that. In fact, if I'm being honest, this sermon was birthed out of moments like that. I'll never forget being in junior high school. Well, now it's called middle school. I went to junior high school in Flushing, Queens, IS 25. And can I tell you that I loved Fridays? As a 65 average student, I loved Fridays. I, I could not wait to leave school. And by the way, I have no embarrassment that I was a 65 average student, okay? My wife is an A-plus student, and guess what? I still got her. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. Like, in my mind, we both made it. <laughs> you got there quicker, but I crossed the line too. We made it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it don't bother me not even a little bit. 65, loud and proud. <laughs> People crying over a B. I'm like, see, we made it. <laughs> Man, that's funny. I'll never forget though this one Friday. I was walking home, my friends, me and a few other guys. And as we're as we're walking home, this this group of older, bigger, stronger kids came and surrounded us. And for whatever reason, they, they pointed me out. They said, Hey, you. I said, Me? Say, yeah, you, we're going to beat you up. Then someone else stepped forward and goes, you know what? We're not going to beat you up, but we're going to take your money. Someone else stepped forward and goes, you know what? We're not going to take your money. It was the most confusing altercation I've ever been a part of. <laughs> and then he goes, now get out of here. I'm like, you don't got to tell me twice, you know what I mean? I just start walking. And as I'm walking away, it's a true story. As I'm walking away, one of them screams out from behind me. But next week, we're going to beat you up. And it's amazing. It's amazing. Because I walked out of the situation completely untouched. I walked out of the situation with the same amount of money I walked into the situation with. They, they did not take anything from me physically. But mentally, mentally, they got me. They got me because although I never saw them again, I heard them every day. Every day that I walked home, I heard their voices. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Now, now, instead of walking home with my friends, the moment that bell rang, I was out. I was gone. I had to make sure that I left school and I got home as quickly as possible, especially on Fridays. A day that I used to love, I now, I now dreaded. Fridays were the absolute worst for me. The moment that bell rang, I ran. I ran out of that school just to get home. And now at 
every, at every corner that I turned, I suspected that I would see them on the other side of it. I, I thought they were right behind me. Any loud noise made me believe that that was then. And what's amazing is something that I used to enjoy doing, I now, lo I now no longer enjoy doing all because of what happened in that moment. I used to love getting pizza with my friends. Now I was out the window. No more going to play basketball. No, no more going to the handball courts. No, no more going to hang out, get ice cream with the friends. None of that. None of that. None of that was even a thought anymore. All because of what happened. And some of you know exactly what it is that I'm talking about. There is something that has happened in your world. There is something that has happened in your life. It could have been the last few years, last few months. Maybe it was just a few days ago, but something happened as a result of it. As a result of it, you are no longer doing the things that you once used to enjoy doing. Maybe it was going to the mall with friends. Maybe it was going to get your nails done. Maybe it was hanging out at a small group at someone's house. Maybe it was hanging out in the lobby. But now because of a conversation that happened, the moment service is over, you are gone and you are right in the car. Something happened and the things that you used to love doing are now not even an option for you you know why because fear doesn't stop death it stops life it stops living you stop doing all the things that you used to love doing because something happened. And if we're being honest, if I was a betting man, I would bet you that whatever it is that this moment that happened to you was on the heels of something great that happened to you. There was something. There was a promotion. Something happened in your marriage. There was a breakthrough in your life spiritually. Something happened. And as a result, as a result of that, as a result of that moment, the enemy said, you know what? I got to get to him. I got to get to her. And you listen and you succumbed to the lies of the enemy and now what was once a joyous victorious moment has been completely forgotten about because all you are hearing reverberating through your mind are the lies of the enemy fear has you stuck but the truth is this is exactly how it works you ever read the story by the prophet named Elijah story is found in 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19, you, you read about this, this prophet named Elijah, and Elijah is used greatly by God. And if you ever read this story, it's a powerful story. Elisha represents our God, and he's standing in front of these false prophets, and these false prophets represent another God, another God, and this, this fictitious, evil, demonic God that they represent are now standing off before this prophet Elisha, and God shows up for Elisha, and as a result of it, proves that these prophets were believing in a God that was not true. So as a result of it, Elisha is then able to kill these prophets. And then exactly after that moment, he's, he's in the desert with the king, with the king that, that represented these false prophets, but would have also been his king in his jurisdiction. His name is Ahab. Ahab is married to a woman named Jezebel, and Jezebel is demon-possessed. prophet tells Ahab, go, go on ahead and eat and drink on the mountain because they were in the middle of a desert. But not only were they in the middle of a desert, they were in the middle of a drought. So Elisha says, after this moment of victory, I'm going to pray. And that's exactly what he starts to do. The Bible says that he starts to pray. And as he's praying, he starts to see a cloud the size of a man's fist appear in the middle of a desert, in the middle of this drought. And all of a sudden, there was a heavy rain. And this heavy rain now starts to pour down. And now it's another victory. It's another miracle for the God that we represent. So then what happens next is that all the men and all the women have to now jump on the horses and the chariots and they now have to start going back inland because the rain is so heavy but the Bible says that the power of God falls upon Elisha he doesn't even need a horse or a chariot he's able to outrun all of them and he gets back inland and then the very next verse says that Ahab told Jezebel what Elisha did so Jezebel sends word to Elisha and she says mark my words I swear by my gods. Which gods? The ones that just lost? I swear by my gods. By this time tomorrow you will be 
dead. And the truth is she, she had nothing to stand on. She, she, she was already proven that her gods weren't true. The next day comes, Elisha's still alive. And yet, and yet, even though all of that is so obvious, it did not matter. It was the way that she said it. She, she said it with such an authority that now Elisha cowers at the words of this very empty promise over his life. And then the Bible tells us that Elisha goes from, from being victorious in that moment to now suicidal. He says, I want to die. And it's amazing. It's amazing because the Bible describes that the hand of God was on him. But can I tell you that it's possible that God's hand be on you and fear still have a grip of you? Both are, simul both are possible. Both can happen simultaneously. It is poor teaching and it's poor doctrine to say that you, well, you have no faith if fear has gotten the best of you. You have to understand that because you are a man of faith or a woman of faith, fear is trying to take you out. The enemy is scared of what you represent and who you are. But this is why you have to be rich in your word and you have to be rich in your prayer closet and you have to be a rich worshiper and prayer understanding that if God be for you because this this enemy that's that's making these empty threats he's he's just saying a whole lot but he has no authority he, he talks a big game it's not a problem he just talks like he is he, he's like a glorified mall cop no disrespect to the mall cops they got the authority in uniform but none in actuality this is why I love this verse so much. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant. Can you put that on the screen for me? Be sober and be vigilant. It says, because your adversary, the devil, thank you so much. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Somebody say like. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, everybody's dealing with the same type of sufferings if you are a child of God, surrendering yourself to the King of kings and Lord of lords. But if you could just leave this up here for a second, I want to break this down. It says, be sober and be vigilant. First, I just want to point out real quick. That the writer here is not talking about liquor when he's saying be sober. Now, that's not a pass to drink. You need a word on not drinking? Don't drink. Don't get drunk, okay? There's your whole word. <laughs> but to understand what this text is actually saying, it's actually way deeper. It's way richer. He says be sober and be vigilant. Be sober, be, be, be of sober mind because what happens is your enemy, he is sneaky and he keeps serving you shots of fear and you keep taking these shots of fear every time he serves it to you but because you're not aware, you're not even realizing it, how he's serving it to you and you keep taking it in every time you go on that social media app even though you know you shouldn't be but every time you scroll, it's like you, you took another shot of fear because comparison got the best of you or or, 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 or seasons have gotten the best of you. you. You see something and you're thinking, why isn't this happening for me? Or you watch that show that everyone else is watching, but for you it's triggering. And every time you watch it, it overwhelms you with fear and it's another shot of fear. Or you tell yourself, I have to have that phone call every Monday at 12 because I went to school with so-and-so and I don't want them to think that I'm rude or that I changed. So every Monday we speak at 12, even though every time I speak to him or every time I speak to her, I hang up the phone more and and I feel perplexed and I feel less than but I got to do it and the enemy keeps serving you shot after shot after shot and because he's so sneaky you keep taking it in without realizing it and he's serving it up in the gossip and he's serving it up in the conversation and he's serving it up through the show and he's serving it up through the social media and here you are saying God I want to live for you and you're trying to walk out this Christian walk you're trying to remain on the straight and narrow but the reason why you're stumbling is because you're living for God, but you keep taking these shots of fear. You don't need the social media. You don't need to watch the show. You don't need the conversation. What you need is to be sober and vigilant because you are worth something. And your adversary, the devil, he walks about trying to kill you. But really, what, what is he? The Bible says he's like a lion. What? 
So he's not even an actual lion. He's playing dress up. He's in costume. He does not trust his own presence enough to intimidate you. So he has to appear like something else. And then he has to use noises that are unnatural to him because he holds no authority. So you're telling me that we're running from, from an adversary that's a like a lion? That's the same game you and your toddler play around the kitchen. You know what I'm talking about? When your toddler goes, rawr, I'm going to get you. And you go, oh, no, don't get me. It's the same thing. <laughs> and here you are running all scared because you got this adversary in costume who doesn't even trust his own authority, who does not even trust his own voices, and you're saved, and you stand on the side of an actual lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings, and Lord of lords. When he opens up his mouth, orbits come out of his mouth. When he opens up his mouth, creation comes into existence. The enemy cannot create anything. He only desecrates. But God gives life and life of abundance. And here you are on the right side behaving like the adversary that's in front of you is greater than the God that's with you. God is saying, I need you to get a dose of the Holy Spirit today. I need you to get a shot of the Holy Spirit today. I need you to get full of who I am so you can start walking, talking, believing, and behaving like the child of God that you actually are because you represent me and I never lose. So start praising, start living, start sleeping, start talking like I am who I actually am. I need some people in the room that say, I know who I'm with. I know who my God is. Take about 30 seconds and give him your best shout. Go. We're running. We're running from a like a lion. From, from, from a like a lion. That's, that's what we're talking about. And to show you, can you just put the verse back up there for a second? It says, seeking who he may devour. What, what's those next two words? Resist him? That's it? I, I don't need a crucifix. I don't need to make the sign of the cross. I don't need holy water. I don't got to pay three payments in 1995 to get some water from the Jordan. I don't, I don't got to do that. I'm, I don't got to light sage. Some of you saw a TikTok video and you thought, oh, I need to do that. I, I need to do that. Trying to protect your house from spirits, actually inviting in other spirits when you already have the Holy Spirit. He says the same power that conquered the grave, it lives on the inside of you. All you got to do is resist him. You don't need to do anything else. Here you are doing the most. He says you don't got to do anything else. All you got to do, here it is, is say no. That's it. Just, just no. Pastor Chris, why are you putting your hip like that? So you don't forget it? No. <laughs> Next time the enemy says, go on ahead, take a hit of this. You just say, uh, no. Go look at that website. No. Go on ahead, gossip with them. No. No, you need to binge watch it so you don't have FOMO. No. Go on, do the thing that you know you're not supposed to be doing. No. Stay in bed all day. Don't be with the kids. No. Drink that bottle till you go to sleep. No. You got to take those pills because it helps you. He says all you have to do is resist him. I do not want to minimize what you're dealing with, but I think we minimize the authority we've been given. You know how the Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper? Let's go a step further. You know why the enemy's forming weapons? Because you are one. The enemy is threatening you because you are a threat. It is not only important that you understand that you're protected, but it is imperative that you understand why you're being attacked. The enemy never cared about Lazarus until he was revived. He went from death to life. There are some other people in the room that have a similar story. They went from death 
to life. They went from blind to I see. I was lost, but now I found. I was once walking in darkness, but now I found the light. I was once a non-believer, but now I'm a believer. Where are all those believers again? You got a story. You have an authority. And because you've been saved, because you're not who you used to be, because your marriage made it, because you're not depressed, because you're no longer suicidal, because you're not addicted, the enemy sees that and he hates that. You're over here going, God, why am I being attacked? You're attacked because you're anointed. He's sending you threats because you are one. You have to understand that your progress in God is bad business for the enemy. You're like, God, I, I feel like there's a target on my back. There is. Only because you're an arrow to heaven. Your life points people to Jesus. Who you are threatens the enemy. Worship team, you could come on up. Lazarus was never a concern of the enemy until after he's resurrected. He never meant anything to the devil until after Jesus resurrected him. It is your testimony that is such of concern to the enemy because as you move forward, your life tells a different story than the one he wants people to believe. Your life is like a bad Yelp review for the enemy. It shows that what he's selling is inaccurate. What he's saying isn't actually true. So like any lawyer that would try to win a case and knows that the other lawyer has a certain amount of evidence, the, the lawyer would try to get that evidence acquitted so that it's not a part of the case. Your life makes the case that God is good. And because of that, the enemy is trying to scare you. He's trying to overwhelm you with fear. Because if he can't get you to stop coming to church, he will try very hard to keep you from being the church. He doesn't want you to believe. He doesn't want you to rejoice. He doesn't want you to worship. He wants you to remain depressed. They can keep going to church as long as they keep coming back to me. And they keep listening to those lies that I'm selling them. And they keep holding on to those things that I'm telling them. And this is where. This is where you got to make the right decisions. Because you know what I love about this story? I love that the Bible says that Lazarus is in the house, and Mary's there, and she's in the house, and Martha's there, and she's in the house, and Mary has her hair down, and she has the oil, and she's pouring it on the feet of Jesus. And while that's happening inside, the outside, the enemy's plotting. But never once do I read that Lazarus leaves the house to argue with the enemy. Never once. Does he leave Jesus to go talk to the priest? Never once does he leave where he is to go deal with his accuser. And there are so many of you that will trade what you have with God because you think that you have to handle it. But God says, you don't need to handle anything. I'm handling it for you. Your business is with me. I want you to fixate on me. I want you to let your hair down in my presence. I want you to take your oil and I want you to pour it on my feet. I want you to worship me. I want you to spend time in my presence because when you're here you're good but when you leave it you suggest something else you suggest that I need your help I don't need your help I need your presence I need you with me I love that Lazarus never goes outside to argue with the leading priest but why would he when he already has the presence of the great high priest why would he trade one for the other he says I don't need to go out there I'm good right here I'm 
I'm good right here. I'm in the presence of God. No, I'm good right here. I got, I got everything I need. I'm good right here. This is the decision you got to make today. I'm not going outside the presence of God. I'm good right here. I'm not going to tell myself I need to watch that. I'm not going to tell myself I have to drink that. I'm not going to tell myself that I have to have those conversations. I'm not going to tell myself that I have to do that because I could talk myself into doing a whole lot of things that I don't need to be doing. And there are moments where I tell myself that I'm smarter than I actually am. But I want to listen to what the Bible is telling me. I want to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling me I'm not going outside of the presence of God I'm staying right here with my hair down and the oil in my hand and I'm placing it at the feet of Jesus and I'm gonna keep on worshiping him and I'm gonna keep praising him because every time I leave this for that I get overwhelmed I got anxious and I get worried so I'm not going back to that anymore I made a decision I'm staying right here with him in fact let me say it this way you ain't gonna catch me outside how about that I'm staying right here in the presence of God. I I made a decision. Some of you keep leaving the presence of God because you think you have to fight for God. Well, if I don't say anything, what are they going to say? Don't worry about it. Just keep praising Jesus. Well, what what if they don't hear my side of the story? They don't need your side of the story. You just need to stay with Jesus. You worried about a narrative? You know what beats a narrative every time? A testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. If your testimony is I'm saved, I stood with Jesus, I promise you, you will have so much peace in your world. But every time you tell yourself that God isn't doing it and God isn't enough and you have to put your hand on it, you are inviting fear into your life. You are inviting the decisions of the enemy to linger in your mind. You are inviting yourself into conversations that actually hold no authority. But the only reason why they have any authority is because you've given it. He says, I want you to find yourself in my presence. I want you to worship me. I want you to find yourself at my feet. I want you to find yourself worshiping me, praising me. Would you stand? If you've been battling fear, come up here. To any degree, been battling fear, come on, up here. Students, newlyweds, been married for years, come up here. Started a new job, come up here. Trying to figure out the future, come on. Struggling with sleep, come up here. Come on, just fill this altar. Just fill this altar. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.